Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for PE Forum's first ESG uh, focused um, uh, investment forum. Uh, throughout this uh, today virtual event, we'll go through the importance of ESG for the Middle East region. Uh, we'll start with the uh, first session uh, with uh, Mrs. Nisreen Suji, CEO uh, for Middle East of uh, Amundi, where we will uh, discuss more in details. Uh, the importance of EHG for the region and what should be the priorities. We'll follow up with another session uh, around private equity uh, importance uh, uh, regarding returns for, for investors. And finally, we'll look at uh, ESG and Sharia uh, compliance uh, in uh, the uh, Middle East. So for our, for our first uh, session, uh, I'm, I'm happy to introduce uh, Mrs. Maali Khadr, who is the CEO of uh, uh, the Middle East uh, Institute for Directors, and she will be uh, hosting this fireside chat with uh, Ms. Nisreen Sruji. I was planning to do it myself, but having a conversation with Maali, I saw that she was much more aware and much more knowledgeable than me about the topic. So. Uh, I said I prefer to have somebody um, uh, better, better informed to lead the conversation. So uh, without further ado, I'll let you uh, move on with your conversation. Uh, Maali, the floor is yours. I to unmute myself. <laughs> Thank you very much, Khaled, uh, and for the opportunity to be here. And uh, it's lovely to be part of this uh, fireside chat with you. Um, if you allow me just to take a moment to introduce you, um, Nisreen is uh, the CEO of the, uh, for the Middle East for Amandi Asset Management. Um, for those that are not aware, Amandi is one of uh, Europe's leading asset uh, manage management company and one of the 10 globally, um, with more than $2.3 trillion in assets uh, under management. Amandi is also known for its uh, responsible, as a res leading responsible investor, uh, with over 900 billion uh, under US dollars in responsible investments. Um, Nisreen herself has over 20 years of experience in the financial industry. Um, she started off as a M&A lawyer in Toronto and then in London with Freshfields. And then after completing her MBA at NC, she became an investment banker at Goldman Sachs in London. And from there, she moved into private equity setting up the first ever mezzanine fund in the Middle East, North Africa region for NBK Capital um, and, and has, has ha had several achievements uh, since then. Um, Nisreen, thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you. Thank you for, uh, uh, for having me. I'm, 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 it's a pleasure for me to be here. Great. I, I'd love, um, as, as Khaled mentioned, ESG is a, is a great passion of mine. So I, I'd love to um, pick your brain and perspective from an in investor point of view, private equity point of view on, on certain ESG issues. Um, just to start with, um, from your perspective, your experience among these um, exposure, what would you say are the important ESG considerations um, in asset allocation? Okay. So we know that um, responsible investment or ESG, and I use them interchangeably, is a, is a global uh, phenomenon um, that has uh, that is here to stay. I mean, it's it's not it's we've been uh, one of the largest responsible investors in the world, as you mentioned earlier, um, and we have been investing in ESG for decades. But we've seen, particularly in the last three four years that it has really grown exponentially. Uh, it's now the ESG market, the responsible investment market is now about $35 trillion globally or 36% of the global AUM. Um, you know, over the last two years alone, it has grown 15% globally. It, it was predominantly in Europe, but we see now uh, the rest of the regions around the world uh, catching up, particularly the US. Uh, the last two years, I've seen 42% growth in the US and also in Asia. And really the reasons for this, um, I'd say are threefold. One is a growing demand from stakeholders and beneficiaries for, for more transparency uh, and for consideration of ESG issues. 
Uh, and you see this also particularly among millennials and among the younger generations, they care more about ESG. Uh, two is um, there's more evidence uh, that at, from both financial industry and academia that um, ESG factors do have an impact on risk and returns. And three, uh, regulation and legislation. And you see this happening globally. Again, starting, it started in, in, in the EU with, with taxonomy, SFDR, MIFID, et cetera, but now uh, uh, going globally. So asset allocators know that this is here to stay. Um, you know, I, I always say we're, we're living through a period which happened about 50 years ago with technology where people thought that venture capital and technology impact, you know, we're just going to basically have an impact on the computer industry and not on anyone else. And, you know, that's not the case. And I think ESG is going to transform um, every portfolio and those who don't realize it are going to be left behind. So sorry, long winded way. What does that mean for asset allocators? It means that they now have to strike a balance between ESG factors and the traditional performance objectives. Um, and you know to be basically successful on on both fronts and even though that looks like a challenge initially when you look at diversification when you look at returns etc it's also a huge opportunity because as I as I said there's such a movement globally towards ESG and responsible investment those opportunities and risks have not been priced in there's a transition period and during that transition period is a huge opportunity for ESG investors, you know, to realize returns and to, to price in returns, uh, sorry, to price in risk that the markets are not currently pricing in. Okay. Um, and and if, if you could give us a little bit of background of how Amundi has transitioned uh, or how is, the trans how is the transition being handled by Amundi towards ESG? I know this didn't happen overnight. Like you rightly said, it's, it's progressively been taking place over the last decade or so. How has this been handled uh, by Amundi? Yeah. No, absolutely, you're right. Um, so Amundi uh, has been dedicated to ESG for decades now. It's part of our DNA. Um, you know, it's it's something that we've been doing uh, since the '90s. Um, it is uh, Amundi is now the largest responsible investor in the world. We have over nine hundred and sixty billion dollars of responsible investments, AUM. Um, it's one of ESG is one of our founding pillars. We have our own business line dedicated to ESG with over forty specialists who do ESG development, research, methodology. We have our own proprietary ESG analysis uh, and rating model, which has you know an over ten years of track record. Um, and we, we rate over 13,500 issuers. Uh, we have, we've had an exclusion policy uh, for a long time for controversial weapons and the normal kind of the normative exclusions um, that violate UN global impact. We've had sectoral exclusions uh, for uh, carbon and tobacco. We have a very robust voting and engagement policy because we're, we're a huge, you know, our AUM globally is over 2 trillion, which means that we are large shareholders in many companies. And so we use that um, for proxy voting. We engage the companies that we're shareholders in. Um, we collaborate with other initiatives like science-based targets, TCFD, green bond principles. And I think more than that, um, we've really been putting our money where our mouth is in terms of ESG by having... Um, key targets for ourselves. So we had an ambitious uh, ESG plan for 2018 to 2021, and we achieved all those targets. So we're 100%, 100% of our actively managed funds are uh, ESG compliant, which means that they have they incorporate ESG criteria that's higher than the benchmark, um, that the relevant benchmark. Um, our responsible, we have responsible um, investment AUM, also in passive investment. Uh, and as I said earlier, continuous dialogue and engagement with issuers. We systematically integrate ESG criteria and voting. And we've just uh, announced recently um, a, a, an even more um, ambitious uh, ESG target plan for 2025. So we recently joined the Net Zero Coalition of Asset Managers. And in line with that, we, we strengthened our own objectives for ESG. So now I told you earlier that 100% of our actively uh, managed open funds are ESG compliant. Now they're also gonna carry the transition assessment. 
So we're going to assess companies based on their decarbonization efforts and their development of sustainable activities. Um, we're establishing um, a net zero solutions offering where we have uh, uh, investment products for our clients, uh, which are broad in range and with, which meet with, uh, with net zero um, uh, compliance. We are we, 20, we've, we're going to reach 20 billion euros of impact investments through expanding our own range. 40% um, of our ETFs will be ESG compliant. Um, we are also even deepening uh, our engagement that I mentioned earlier in terms of our investee companies and, um, and the engagement we have with them, um, you know, through helping them to deploy their own climate um, engagement plan. Um, and actually the most important, not, not the most important, but one of the most important things is that we're actually integrating ESG criteria into our own remuneration policy. So starting this year, um, our executives and management have ESG KPIs and it's tied to their pay. And I think that really speaks, you know, more than anything because it's, it's, a, more, it's a much more personal goal as well to our senior management. I can't begin to tell you how, how wonderful it is to hear all of this. Uh, so congratulations on the achievements and, and I have so many questions, but uh, let's <laughs> face ourselves. Um, so from what you've described and what you've seen, how do you think the Middle East plays a different role or how do you think the Middle East is differentiated, if at all, from, from the global uh, landscape? I mean, are they the same priorities? The principles may be the same, but the practices or the things you look for might be different. Um, I'd love to hear your input about that. So that's a really um, interesting question because when we, we, we've been in the region for over 20 years and we've been talking to investors about ESG for, for a long time. And we were always very sensitive about uh, talking about um, you know, the climate aspect of it or the social aspect of it, just given cultural sensitivities, given the fact that you know, a, lo a lot of the countries in the region are, um, are carbon economies. You know, it's, uh, there's a lot of oil. Uh, oil is a big part of our region. That, that's the reality. But, I, but the last few years, what we've seen happening is that actually Middle Eastern investors are behaving no differently from others around the globe. They've really started to formally embrace ESG investing. And it's, you know, it's music to our ears and, and it warms our hearts because this is something we've been beating the drum about for so long. Um, and I think a large part of it also is what's driving ESG globally, which is all the, all the factors that I've mentioned earlier, but also that mil millennials in the Middle East are no different than, you know, their global counterparts. They've been brought up in an era of globalization and connectivity and, and climate change. So these things are important to them. And we're starting to see that kind of translate more um, into, into the culture. I think in the past, people were much more focused on investment performance uh, now people are recognizing, you know, the, 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 import, the increased kind of social benefits and societal benefits and impact. And you see across the governments in, in, in the Gulf, uh, governments embracing uh, sustainability. And, you know, to be fair, this is not something new. I think uh, governments in this region have always had a very long term view and have always kind of managed things with a view to the future. Um, but you see much more. A specific focus. So, for, for example, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030 incorporates uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which is incredible. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, spending on infrastructure, as we hear about all these impressive projects, like you know, the green hydrogen plant, um, the, the the Saudi Green Initiative. Um, initiatives by the PIF, which is the Sovereign Wealth Fund of, of Saudi Arabia, um, uh, things like the, the uh, NEOM, I mean, the, the NEOM development, the Red Sea development, all of the infrastructure that they're doing um, in the country, we see it in the UAE as well. Um, and it, it, the UAE, I think, has been at the forefront of sustainability for a long time. If you look at initiatives that Mubadala is doing and Abu Dhabi is doing, you know, the whole of the UAE, you know, even the smaller countries in the GCC, um, like Bahrain, for example, have a national development program and have a Vision 2030 as well, which are underpinned by sustainability. So you really see this wide embrace. If you, if you look at, I talk always about people putting their money where their mouth is. And if you look at how these governments are also 
investing through their sovereign wealth funds. And these are these are so, these are funds that were set up to diversify um, the economies of, of the Gulf away from oil. And you see that that their investment activity through these funds is also much more and more focused on ESG. So, for example, PIF recently sent an announced request for proposals for developing its ESG policy. I mean, this is huge, and it, it trickles down. Similarly, others, you know, have have um, announced. Um, adding ESG criteria into their index equity investment, among other things. You see it also through the stock exchanges um, who are committing um, to, to net zero. Um, so Bahrain, for example, uh, released the voluntary ES, ESG reporting guidelines for listed companies. Uh, the Tadawul in Saudi was the first country to announce plans to launch an ESG index. And it launched uh, also reporting guidance on ESG Kuwait as well launched ESG guidance. Um, the, there's a sustainable stock exchanges initiative, which encourages stock exchanges to promote um, responsible investment. And to date, all of these countries that I mentioned, Saudi, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, UAE, have partnered and committed to combine, uh, committed, uh, uh, sorry, to, to um, uh, responsible investment principles and to having a market cap of over three trillion uh, to, towards that end. And then if you if you look at um, investors generally, so I talked about governments, I talked about the stock exchanges, the, the uh, sovereign wealth funds, but also just the investors on the ground. I mean, more and more investors in the region um, have ESG policies. So as an estimated 36% of, of Middle East investors currently have firm-wide ESG policies. Uh, for, I'm just giving you numbers because I think it just, it really solidifies, solidifies what's to show. happening. Yeah, 41%, um, uh, which is higher than the global average. Uh, so 41% of Middle East investors intend to develop the necessary policies. They don't have them. And 47% of Middle East investors believe it's the right thing to do. And that's higher than the global average. So in some ways, we're even surpassing the global average. And, and, and not to present a rosy picture because there's still a lot to be done. But it's it's changing and it's it's uh, it's materially changing, which is wonderful to see. Um, okay, very insightful. What do you think would be the key challenges? Um, so, I mean, it, it's lovely to hear that the Middle East is trailblazing or you know going above and beyond the global averages. What would be the the push that would help us achieve uh, those those that ESG growth? Um, wh where are the gaps? Uh, because I'm just going back to something you've said. In addition to the possible gaps that you can think of, have you co come across a lot of um, regulatory limitations? So where regulations are somewhat preventative or prohibitive towards you know, the ESG global standards and where you know, policy change is required. Um, along with, you know, what are the other challenges or what is the push that we need to achieve our uh, inspirational ESG title? Okay. So a lot of the global, um, okay, in, ter in terms of regulation, um, I think people look at what's happening in Europe and the, and the level of, 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 require of requirements um, on companies, on investors to not only uh, not only in terms of disclosure, um, but also in terms of even making available to their own clients um, products that, that, that are aligned with their ESG preferences. So it's, it's, top, it's kind of bottom down driven and it's also uh, bottom up driven by, by investors. And I think a lot of regions, including the Middle East, are seeing um, the, the regulation that's happening in Europe uh, and realizing actually that this is really where the world is headed. There, this is a wave and a movement that really is not going to be stopped. And if you look at, for example, uh, one example, the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment. And this is something that was launched in 2006. And when it was launched in 2006, um, 63 asset managers at the time committed and signed up. This is 2006. So fast forward to 2018. Now you have 1,715 asset managers signed up. Fast forward to February, 2020, there's about 3,000 signatories. And this includes, you know, this includes um, 
regional governments and, and regional investors. So I think there's a growing realization that these future changes to regulation that are coming. Um, I talked about, uh, you know, um, millennials and the shifting, shifting uh, um, values of, of millennials, the shifting uh, consumer preferences that, that we're seeing um, and are basically more and more inducements that will have a more meaningful impact on uh, the demand for ESG. And when you see that there's more of a demand for, for, um, for ESG policies, for disclosure, for all of these things, it's going to have an impact on asset values. You know, and we've seen that in the public markets. And we're actually seeing that more and more in the private markets. And that's really important, I think, for our audience, who are largely private equity um, uh, investors and, and you know, involved in the private equity industry, that you see more and more adoption of ESG reporting standards uh, in the private markets as well. And what's really important is that LPs, so limited partners who are invest investing in a lot of these private equity companies are increasingly demanding um, uh, a compliance with ESG. So if you look again at numbers, the so 63% of LPs have public policies relating to ESG. 59% of LPs are signatories to the United Nations PRI uh, framework, which I mentioned uh, earlier, and 40% actually publish reports on ESG activities. So there's a huge push from LPs for the, their GPs to be um, uh, ESG compliant. The GPs themselves have not been as quick to adopt. And I think it, it, it's largely due to reporting. I think this is where, where you're getting at. That's really one of the, the challenges. There's a lot of managers um, uh, have delayed their adoption of ESG uh, reporting because there's been, well, two inconsistencies actually. One is in data reporting and one is in talent shortages. Um, data, of course, is easier to get uh, for publicly listed companies, not as easy to get for private companies. Uh, and um, generally, you know, talent shortage in terms of people that are well-versed in ESG. But this has not stopped LPs from, from pushing. Um, uh, and I think as valuations of companies go up and the number of investable opportunities goes down um, and investment risk increases, you know, ESG will become a key differentiator for GPs. And so there's much more incentive for GPs to really look at this and really embrace this because their LPs are demanding it. You know, it, it's, it's and then in, in term valuation, it's going to be a huge differentiator when they're when they're raising money, um, and also a huge differentiator for for returns, as we talked about earlier. I think this will open up opportunities as well for um, uh, ESG advisory services for these GPs because you're going to need you know uh, more expertise in this area. Uh, there's more demand. There will be an increasing demand also in this region for ESG talent. Um, to join these GPs and be able to, uh, to embrace ESG, to look at data, to look at how to collect data, to look at how uh, to evaluate companies um, where you don't have easily available publicly, uh, public data, where you have to, you know, get it on your own. Um, so th there, are, there, there are challenges, but they're also leading to a lot of opportunities. Um I mean, based on this uh, drive uh, between LPs and influencing uh, GPs, is there a timeline um, to transition? Is there a timeline to adapt? Um, and what are the consequences if they don't? Well, there, there, I don't think there's a specific um, uh, timeline, um, but I, I just think that, the, I mean, you see the, the, the volatility in markets, for example, we, we never know how <laughs> things are, uh, things evolve over time. But it, 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 if you just look at it from a high level, um, it, it's the, the, the shift towards responsible investing, the shift towards ESG is something that's here to stay. And it's increasing exponentially. And it's increased exponentially in the last, you know, two years alone. Um, so you know, the, the sooner I think investors realize this, the sooner companies realize this, um, you know, the, the better positioned they will be. And in the meantime, you know, the, 
they're able to take advantage of um, risk that hasn't been priced in and opportunities that haven't been priced in as this shift is happening. So there's a lot of opportunity to be gained in that transition. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's a societal thing. So it's not, um, uh, the, 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 it, it's beneficial not just to, to the investors themselves, it's beneficial to the companies, it's beneficial um, to the communities, it's beneficial to the societies um, and beneficial to, I mean, to the globe. I think this is a, it's, it's a good movement, it's a good shift. Uh, and I think the sooner um, investors uh, educate themselves more about it, um, the better, the better all of us uh, will be, you know, over the long term. Preaching to the choir there, this um, I just want to go back to a couple of things you said. Um, you talked about how 100% of your asset is ESG, uh, in mm. line with ESG. And I also noticed you have a responsible investment fund and a social impact fund and all. How is the responsible investment fund different from ESG? And I know you said earlier that they're synonymous terms. Um, mm. I, I would be inclined to agree with you, but I'm a little confused. Why is this a different fund versus uh, some of the other funds? Okay. I think that the terminology in this area is very confusing. Um, you know, there's so you many think? different terms. Seriously, there are so many different terms. There are so many different... It's... Uh, what, so we, we actually have, because we manage, um, we manage a lot of responsible, I'll, I'll break it down for you. We have, as I said earlier, about $960 billion uh, in responsible investment to AUM. So what does that mean? Um, it, it, it's um, in, it, across different categories and across different asset classes. Okay. So we have uh, um, products that focus on the environment, for example, so green bonds, um, uh, which you hear about, you know, green equity. Uh, we have green um, private and real assets, and we have um, uh, products that focus on the social aspect of ESG. So, as you said earlier, social bonds, um, social equity, social impact investment. Okay, so these are specific um, um, asset classes where. Um, investors who want um, green bonds specifically, you know, for, for environmental uh, strategies, will invest in green bonds. Or those who want social bonds um, that that have that are related to societal goals um, will invest in social bonds. But then we also integrate ESG policies into the rest of our investment policies, the rest of our investment uh, approach. So um, we have. Uh, what we call ESG best in class um, strategies. Okay, so these are kind of ESG mainstream um, uh, strategies and Amundi's own um, uh, responsible investment strategies that we apply in our own investment um, process. We have strategies where, we, for example, where we focus on not companies that are ESG compliant, but we focus on investing in companies that we're calling improvers. So companies who are on an, on an ESG path, but not there yet, who are improving. And we're looking at um, th their potential growth. And this is a huge uh, potential area for, for returns, right? Because they're taking these steps and those steps are gonna, the, the result of those uh, positive steps are gonna end up um, having, you know, very good returns in, in several years time. And so it's a forward looking approach. We have strategies for passive investors who wanna invest in um, uh, ESG that, that's passive, but that replicates ESG indices. And then we also have strategies where we, we design um, uh, the, the strategy based on what the, invent, what the investor uh, wants. So it, it, it's really, a, a smorgasbord, as they say, of of, uh, of strategies and approaches um, that we have, you know, d depending on what the investor wants um, and depending on what they want to focus on. Some people care more about the environment. Some people care more about you know, social aspects. Some people care a lot about governance. So it, it just depends. And then for those investors who um, uh, want an across-the-board approach, where we're we're applying our own filter. 
um, we can do that, or we can even apply their filter or filters that are uh, you know, kind of global government uh, filters. So it's a very flexible approach and it really just depends on the goals of the investor and um, what's important to them. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'm very, um, I wanna talk about terminology. I wanna break down, take the opportunity to break them into environment, social and governance. Um, and I want to ask you, which do you think um, they have, they are of equal importance or not equal importance, I don't think that's fair, equal impact on asset value um, and if there are any priorities. But before you answer, I think I, we can open the, uh, a poll to the audience to see um, whether, what would be your priority area, environment, social or governance, and then, and then maybe we can discuss the results. Um, Khaled, can I trouble you to put the poll up? Thank you. I think we'll give everybody a few minutes to, to respond. Um, so yeah, the, when the results are out, Khaled, I assume you'll share them with us or at least tell, tell us what they are. Anxiously waiting. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, I think, uh, Mr. Yun, I'd love to hear um, your input Your input on the, whether they, oh, there are the results. So 64% governance, uh, environment 27%, and social nine percent. I think that is fascinating. What about you? Are these the sort of results you expected? Um, we, I, I'm not sure what I wasn't sure actually. I, I wasn't sure. I thought people would put more, more, uh, more environment, but I think they're 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 all important. Um, and just in terms of their impact on returns, for example, I wanted to mention that we've done a lot of research on. The impact of these different factors on the environment, on social and governance, on performance of, of companies. And we saw different um, factors play out over different periods of time and depending on the, the geography. So it, I thought it was really interesting, for example, that um, during COVID, um, we saw much more um, focus on the social uh, aspect. So when I say social aspect, if you think about things like health and safety, working conditions, um, labor relations, supply chain, um, you know, product and customer responsibility. And you, you understand why that, has, that became so much more important during COVID and more important to investors to focus on companies that had good health and safety standards that allowed their workers, um, you know, that made sure that they were socially distancing, that made sure that, 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 that they had, um, uh, insurance policies and healthcare and all of that for their workers. And so you saw during COVID and especially in the US actually, um, that those companies performed better. There was a better uh, uh, return uh, for those companies that focused on the social aspect. Now you're seeing more, um, that's so important of course, but and in the past governance was super important globally. I think now there's such a focus on environment um, just given global warning, uh, warming, given all of the initiatives that are being taken globally on the environment. And you see that there's an increasing focus on that aspect, the E aspect um, of ESG, uh, more, you know, uh, um, on the investment side, um, um, more innovation happening in terms of uh, what, what people are investing in, the types of products that with a focus on E. So things like emissions um, and energy, um, water management, um, biodiversity, pollution, also supply chain on the environmental side. So um, it's, it's, it's really interesting, um, but I think, you know, all of them, all of these factors have uh, impact on performance um, in a positive direction, but it's, it's, uh, it just, plays out differently at different times, depending on what's happening in, in the rest of the world. I mean, interesting is a, is a good way of putting it. I think that's an understatement, but uh, fair. Um, 
I know uh, Amandi started with a focus on environment with the low emission fund and the green bond and, and then kind of went into the social impact. Out of curiosity, because they are very different spaces, um, were you able to extrapolate any learnings from the, the, the low emission fund and the green bond into, for example, the social impact fund or are they very different principles? I think the principles are, are similar. I mean, in terms of um, uh, the approach that we take uh, um, to setting up funds where people can invest in, and that funds that are going to have impact on the area that they want to invest in. We're seeing um, more interest in social bonds, but this is something that's new. So I think it, I think it takes, it'll take a bit of time. Uh, you know, green bonds, for example, which are focused on the environment um, have been around for longer. Uh, but I think I think social bonds will continue uh, to, uh, to to grow, and this is an area that is really important to Mundi. And when you think about the, tra the transition, um, uh, the, the, the transition towards clean energy, you know, the transition uh, that's happening globally, um, it's important that uh, people are not left behind. I think this is something that we certainly focus a lot on. So. Uh, climate change, COVID, all of these things affect, for example, uh, tend to affect um, the, the, the lower earning segments uh, of society. They have a much more disproportionate effect than disproportionate on effect. earning. And yeah, so all of that plays into that social aspect and plays into social bonds and what they target. Um, okay. So, so it, it's really... Uh, um, it, it's great to see that that's growing in prominence. Impact investing generally has grown a lot. I mean, um, initially there were stages of kind of the evolution of, of, of ESG or responsible investment development. Initially it was about excluding companies then that kind of moved into best in class and looking at companies that have best practices in ESG, you know, and it, it, it's, it's really evolved. Now it's, it's becoming increasingly about impact investing and measuring the actual impact of your investments rather than just applying ESG filters. Okay, and uh, I, I'm sure the audience is just as excited I am with many questions. So I just wanna have ask one last question myself uh, and of particular focus and interest for me is, is the governance aspect, uh, being an IOD, um, it, I think it's a core pillar in driving ESG forward. And I know that Amandi's used a lot of its um, voting rights and proxy in, in voting for and against certain governance practices. So question for you, what are the, the governance considerations? What are the governance matters that you look at as, a, as an investor um, in regards to a an, an potential investee, a, a potential, uh, what, are the what are the things you look at and focus on? So we, we have continuous dialogue with the companies um, that we invested in, um, that we are investors in. Uh, so, um, we, so just to give you an example, in 2020, we voted at over 4,000 annual general meetings. Um, and we initiated dialogue on the energy transition and climate change alone with about 472 companies. So when we have that kind of engagement, it, do, it, it really influences companies to, 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 to move towards um, ESG compliance. Um, the, in terms of, of governance, I mean, I think being a European asset manager um, and being in Europe, which, which, has, which, is so much, uh, which has so much in terms of re regulation uh, on ESG and so many regulations, for example, to prevent greenwashing um, and uh, to strengthen protections for investors and, and improve disclosures. You know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger onus on us as a European asset manager uh, to make sure that, that, that we get that right and that um, um, uh, all of that we have an ESG culture basically uh, and, 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 and which we do. So to just to answer your question. So when we look at governance, um, aspects specifically in the companies that, that we invest in. We look at things like board structure, um, you know. Independent uh, directors. Independent directors. Uh, how many women are on the board? 
um, which is Diversity. very important. By the way, our, our, our CEO, our global CEO, I think is, is, is one of the few uh, women CEOs at large asset management firms globally. And we're very proud of this. She's, she's, I mean, she's excellent in her own right, but she happens to be a woman and that's fantastic. Um, audit, we look at audit and control, um, you know, their processes. We look at uh, remuneration. And I mentioned earlier how important remuneration was for us. That we even, you know, our own management is tied, exactly. Uh, shareholders' rights. Um, ethics, uh, tax practices, and ESG strategy, you know, the fact whether they have an ESG strategy as part of their governance structure. At a board level and whether it's integrated to at the heart of their... Brilliant. Um, I, I believe hands have started to come up. So, um, uh, Steve, um, thank you. If you could just introduce yourself and ask your question, that'd be great. Do I have to un unmute you or Khaled? I don't know how this works. Hello? Okay, I'm technologically challenged. Uh, until the audience can engage, you can either, I believe, chat or ask questions, uh, raise your hand and we can, something's happening. Hello? Hi, Dr. Mark. As we get oh. the technology sorted, uh, I, I do wanna, wanna, I know you said ESG is here to stay. And personally, I would agree with you, but, how, how do we know that it's um, here to stay in the long term and, and not then transformed into another form of um, greenwashing or uh, an, a marketing ploy or a, a strategy to focus on the competitive advantage because we have ESG and losing what I suppose what I'm trying to say is losing the spirit behind why ESG was, has come to. And how can we constantly make sure that organization follow the spirit and maybe not the letter of, of uh, ESG? Yeah, no, th I mean, that's a very, very valid uh, concern. And we've seen um, recent controversies with, with some asset managers in the press who were accused of, of greenwashing um, uh, and, you know, you, you, you looking at uh, the flows that are going into ESG and falsely claiming that their uh, their products that they, were ESG compliant, and I think in answer to that, um, we're seeing um, an increasing uh, increasing regulations and increasing expectations for for transparency. Um, so uh, a lot, for example, I mean, I keep going back to the to the to Europe because they've just they've been so focused on this. So the EU taxonomy, for example, um, has specific environmental objectives, um, climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, pollution prevention, um, sustainable use of water and marine resources, healthy ecosystems. And it, it allows uh, or enables market um, participants to identify those uh, uh, labels and invest in, uh, in those assets with more confidence. So if they look at a fund that has, um, uh, has, has a, a label, um, it's been vetted basically, and they're able to, uh, to be confident that they are actually investing in something that, that is doing what it purports um, to say. Um, there are a lot of protections that have been implemented uh, for investors by other uh, um, EU initiatives like the, 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 the SFDR, uh, which are regulations that uh, were passed over the past recently, well, not, I guess, last year, not that recently, um, that strengthened, two years ago, I should say, sorry, um, they really strengthen the protection um, of investors of, of financial products. They have Im improved disclosures um, and really allowing investors to make more, more informed decisions. So they impose additional transparency, additional disclosure, um, and meaning and additional reporting. So asset management firms 
had to be able to back up their statements with hard numbers um, and allowing clients to make more, more informed decisions. So it is a concern. There have been firms that have um, done greenwashing. I think it's, you know, but I think there's a lot of, a lot of protections now that investors have against that. Okay. And again, based on uh, your experience and having so much vested in ESG as uh, in, in the funds and in, in the products and services that you provide, what would be, I guess, your, your advice for, for PEs entering the region or for PEs coming to uh, thinking of ESG? What would be your advice for them in how to embed, manage, analyze, assess ESG uh, moving forward? or the key I, learnings or yeah I, I think a lot of so it, it depending on what they're investing in I think that if they if people are investing and in, in investors are investing in publicly listed companies you know the information is more readily available because those companies have disclosure obligations you know but by their regulators by the stock exchanges where their shares are listed so it's easier and as I said earlier those stock exchanges have started to incorporate um, ESG requirements. And so, you know, that for, for public investors, I think it's, it's, it's an easier, uh, it's an easier course of, of, uh, of action. For private investors, it's a little bit more challenging to get information from, from private companies that they're investing in. But it's, it's, it's an increasingly important requirement. So it's something that needs to be incorporated. It is more challenging also in emerging markets um, where you don't have the same level of, of, of governance, where there are a lot of family firms that don't necessarily, you know, are not used to having um, that kind of disclosure, um, as you would see maybe in, in more developed uh, markets. Um, so it is, it is more challenging in emerging markets, but it's not a challenge that's going to go away. You know, I mentioned earlier that LPs, um, increasingly require this and LPs in the region increasingly require this. So if you have any hope of raising money as a private equity investor, as a GP, you don't have a choice. You have to incorporate and look at ESG. This is where the direction is going. Um, and the sooner you do it, the better. So it's really worth investing um, in, in your employees and hiring people who, who have knowledge of ESG, investing in training programs, like anything else. I mean, you know, if you look at people do valuations of companies in different ways, there's not one standard thing that everybody uses. People look at different methods of valuation. And so I, I don't think that, you know, lack of data or lack of agreement on uh, ESG standards should stop anyone from, from, from adopting ESG because it, you still, it, just like it doesn't stop anyone from investing just because valuation methods are different, you know. Um, it's 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 a it's it's an approach that is um, uh, is here. It is a direction that the world is going towards, and um, you know it's something that that we all need to to adopt. That's just the reality of it. Um, before I ask another question about disclosures, just wanted to tell the audience I've been told there's a Q and A button at the bottom. Uh, and you can type your questions and then I can uh, post them and we can discuss them. So please uh, feel free to go ahead and do that. Um, in the meantime, just going back to something you said, Justine, disclosure of ESG. And, and I wanna pause on that challenge uh, for a bit. How, I mean, I see a lot of people saying things, they disclose this information. I have no way of validating this information. Uh, I have no way of, making sure it's accurate. And even the regulatory bodies and the stock exchanges that have ESG disclosure requirements, they really don't dictate uh, a formula or an assurance or a validation to this information. It's a guideline to disclose, but it's not, a, uh, it's, it's not like your audited statements. We're not there yet. Um, so, so what would be your advice with regards to that? I mean, I think in Europe, it is a regulation. It's not a guideline. It's, it's the law. It's, it's required. And I think that's to, where... To disclose. But yes, how... yes. Our disclosure, the, the, these are regulations that um, uh, where you, you, the companies have to 
make these disclosures available to investors. It's, it's, it's their regulator, so they need to comply, otherwise their license is revoked. Either, you know, there are consequences, just like with any other regulations um, for auditing disclosures, for any other you know, just, uh, regulations for financial companies. Um, it's a similar thing. So we are moving in that direction. It's not, it's not necessarily a guideline. I think it's becoming uh, stricter. Um, so, I'm sorry, I think you misunderstood. The, the, you're absolutely correct. There, there are new reg regulations and, and requirements for disclosure, but the quality of that disclosure is not dictated on a regulatory level. Uh, so disclose your GHG emissions, on what standards would you disclose your GHG emissions, to what extent, uh, the, the intricate details behind how you've calculated that. If you really don't disclose that information, then the value of that disclosure in and of itself is not sufficient or is not telling enough. So the quality, yeah. the question is not the disclosure variable, but but what's behind it, the quality of it, the, the period of it, the, the parameters that go behind it. Okay, I, I understand what you're, what you're what you're saying. So, um, just as a as a if I as an example, um, if I look at um, the data that we have uh, and that we use um, from companies that we invest in, we deal we uh, we get data ESG data from fourteen different providers at least. Okay, so for example, MSCI, um, CDP, TrueCost. There are a lot of um, PCFD. Yeah, for, of ESG uh, information. And in addition to that data, um, we also have our own, we combine it with our own data and our own process. And this is how we evaluate. And that's kind of our process of due diligence, if, if, if you want to call it that. And, you know, similarly in the way that private equity investors invest in companies, and have to do their own due diligence to see whether the the what you know the, the information they're being given to vet the information that they're being given. Um, so this is so it's a similar it's a similar it's a, basically a due diligence process, and you're vetting the information that you're getting from the companies that you want to invest in, in, in the same way. Um, and ESG is is you know one more factor, if you will, or three more factors, or however, um, that you're looking at in addition to the financial factors um, that you're looking at and you have to do your due diligence and you and you know you have uh, um, uh, sources of information that vet them for you like auditors and um, uh, accounting firms etc and in the same way you, you have that on the ESG side as well so I think as uh, people become more familiar with ESG um, it, it will become easier and easier to incorporate these processes into the usual, you know, uh, um, due diligence processes when they're looking at investments. It kind of becomes part of an overall uh, picture. And you can't, I mean, uh, sorry. Sorry, and I love what you said earlier about how using ESG as a tool to, to also cost the risks and the opportunities um, to give you a, a comprehensive picture, I suppose, along with the financial uh, accounts. We do have two questions from the audience. So I'm just gonna, read one and we'll go through that and then address the next. Um, so this is from Sam Mirza, thank you. Um, a lot of the largest names in the region are, you took it off Khaled, where are you taking it? <laughs> this is so confusing. Uh, all right, no, he said he answered it. Okay, uh, a lot of the largest names in the region are obviously national oil companies. What is Amandi's view on how these companies who care to do a lot on the environmental front should think about ESG. For example, is there a possibility of doing a green financing if they are investing majorly in green hydrogen or, or solar, or must it be a transition style approach only? Thank you, um, Sam, for that. Okay. Um, look, I, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert on, on, on oil specifically, but our approach generally is that um, all of us have a responsibility um, uh, towards society. And, and we are um, on our side really convinced that the, the, the 
acceleration of our own kind of commitments to ESG is, is the first lever of growth for us anywhere around the world. Um, and then in terms of, you know, directing the capital that our clients entrust us with towards businesses and projects um, that promote a fair transition, we do that. And, you know, and then we, as I said earlier, we have an ongoing uh, dialogue with, with companies and, with, and especially those um, in which we're the main shareholder on their ESG uh, strategies and prospects. And then we ourselves um, you know, also um, try to act in a responsible way and we, we're applying to ourselves what we demand um, of, of others. Um, you know, inter but there's also a responsibility for that, that, that governments play and that um, uh, is a public question really. It's not, it's not, um, um, it's not something that we um, necessarily, you know, that, that we, it, it's part of our, we have kind of our role to play and I think governments have their, their role to play. I think in terms of hydrogen specifically, um, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, we have our own hydrogen fund that we've launched because we see that that's a direction that, um, you know, that the, the that sector is going in. It's something that's potentially beneficial from an environmental perspective. We think it's a potential uh, investment opportunity. And so it's something that we, we ourselves are, are investing in and, 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 and launching funds in. So, um, and then I mentioned earlier that we also work with companies that um, are earlier in their transition, earlier in their ESG journey. Um, and we help them um, with that with that transition. So we, we don't, um, the, the exclusion uh, policy has evolved over the years, as I mentioned earlier, and has really become more, started with exclusion and moved to best in practice um, engagement. And we are really much more active on the engagement side in terms of you know, working with companies to get them along on their ESG journey and to meet those targets rather than um, excluding or um, uh, making, you know, taking kind of a blanket um, view. Um, but we also really put our money where our mouth is in terms of our own approach. And as far as hydrogen, you know, that's something that we ourselves are looking at as well. So it's whatever we're applying to others we're, we're applying to ourselves as well. Um, Nassine, although I can go on for, for a long, long time with many questions, I'm afraid uh, we're running out of time. I, I wanna thank you very much uh, for, for all the information you shared with us. I personally have a lot of key takeaways from this. Um, and, and I do wrap up, I do wanna wrap up by saying, I mean, thank you for the commendable work on, on the engagement front. Uh, it was, for anybody that has the time, please do read Amundi's uh, engagement report. Some of the work and the engagement that they've undertaken has been, it's, it's phenomenal in, in finding answers because as Nassine has mentioned, there really is no one size that fits all. There really isn't a model that we can just copy paste um, across the globe or in different regions or for environment to social to governance. But, but there are ways that we can leverage the learnings from other organizations um, to, to improve on that front. Um, so Nassim, thank you very much once again. Thank you, thank you for having me and thank you for focusing on this. It's, it's an important topic for all of us. <laughs>